Good evening, coming up tonight. An off-campus apartment complex has been dealing with a critical issue. Plus, Gamecock women's basketball hits the hardwood for the first time. Boo! Halloween is coming early to the Riverbank Sioux this year. But first, SGTV's Nicole Smith is in the studio here with us now. Nicole, what weather can we expect to see this weekend? We could be expecting to have some warmer weather coming up, but a cold front won't be far behind. Also be expecting to hear about a stormy weekend in Texas. I'll have the weather forecast for this week and more for you tonight on SGTV Student News at 7. Live from the Kennedy Greenhouse Studio. This is Student News at 7. Good evening, Carolina. I'm Elizabeth Martinez. And I'm Clarissa Meyer. Thanks for joining us tonight. It's just about that time to start looking for next year's housing arrangements or time to renew those leases. Cheaper rates come along with off-campus living but can be a hassle when dealing with traffic, parking, and more. But one off-campus complex is facing a more serious issue. According to the Sheriff's Department of Incident Reports, three people have been shot at the Rowan in under one week's time. Two people were shot on October 18th around 8 p.m. The department has said those victims are expected to recover, but another person was shot this past Monday morning while sitting on the parking lot outside the complex. Following Monday's incident, the property manager sent out an email to residents regarding security gate damage. The email stated that management takes this very seriously and that residents who are found inviting strangers on the property for parties will be held accountable. This isn't the first time the Rowan has been in the midst of crossfire. In spring of 2020, USC released a crime alert about the apartment complex and that following summer, a 19-year-old was murdered. USC is not affiliated with the off-campus community. USC's Fall Literary Festival began earlier this month and continued yesterday. SGTV News reporter Bridget Burkowski tells us about the event. I'm here at the Fall Literary Festival hosted by University Libraries and the English Department here at USC. This year's featured author is Dr. J. Drew Lanham. The Fall Literary Festival highlights three authors for three Wednesday nights here on campus. This year's authors include poet Atsuro Riley, Dr. J. Drew Lanham, and journalist Amina Lukman Dawson. Other departments such as the School of Information Science, Women's and Gender Studies, and the Center for Civil Rights History and Research have also contributed to the festival this year. The purpose of bringing them is that students um, are reading those materials in class, those books are being recommended to them by their professors, and the MFA students and other students have the opportunity to listen to a craft talk by the author and talk about their process um, and get tips uh, in an informal setting. This night at the festival highlighted South Carolina native and author Dr. J. Drew Lanham. Along with being a writer and poet, Dr. Lanham is also a certified wildlife biologist and professor at Clemson University. Drawing inspiration from nature with historical influences, Dr. Lanham has received several awards and prizes for his literary works. Dr. Lanham emphasizes the importance of communicating effectively and the fundamentals of literature. So the literary festival concentrates words in a way that allows students, faculty, staff, the community to access literature, to access words. That's why it's critical. The celebration of the Fall Literary Festival isn't over yet. Be sure to check out journalist Amina Lukman Dawson next Wednesday, November 1st, in the Hollings Special Collections Library on the main level of Thomas Cooper Library. For SGTV News, I'm Bridget Kuchowski. Thanks, Bridget. A prominent Five Points bar, the Cotton Gin, announced over the weekend that it is closing down. The popular bar took to X and Instagram to thank their supporters and to announce that their last night will be November 25th, the day of the Carolina Clemson game and two days after Thanksgiving. Cotton Gin has had a close connection with the Gamecock community through the Garnet Trust NIL partnership where one dollar was donated for every item sold off their menu on the iconic NIL Thursdays. USC students past and present mourn the bar's closing, posting comments such as, quote, 
I am so beyond heartbroken, will forever cherish my moments here. End quote. But the heartbreak is short-lived because the building spirit will live on with New Brooklyn Tavern moving in. New Brooklyn Tavern talent booker Carlin Thompson says they discovered the building was being sold back in August and that it was, quote, the one location that kind of felt like it could be the New Brooklyn Tavern in some way, end quote. After taking a couple looks at different areas like the Vista, they finalized that Five Points was the best location due to the additional foot traffic it brings. School can be like a second home, and now a recent school district decision is creating some controversy. Richland One administrators recently announced nearly 11 educators will move to different campuses mid-year. The school board met Tuesday to discuss the reassignments. It was at the very top of their agenda. Teachers have five days to transition. They will also have time to speak to their former students and move out of their classroom. But both parents and teachers voiced their concerns over the adjustment during the meeting. One council member says communication is vital to finding a solution. We cannot reassign our way out of ignoring teachers. We've got to pay attention to them. Earlier this week, hundreds of students, teachers, and parents rallied outside the R1 building marching to the State House against the decision. They're calling for more transparency and accountability. Despite the pushback, the district is moving forward with the reassignments. South Carolina law enforcement division officials have charged a former Berkeley County Sheriff's deputy for an assault that took place early last year. 61-year-old Randall Morris Timmons is facing third-degree assault and battery charges. The charges stem from an incident that took place while Timmons was on jury on January 18, 2022. According to an arrest warrant, Timmons was attempting to arrest a suspect for failure to stop for blue lights. During that arrest, the suspect refused to get on the ground and Timmons deployed his taser. Timmons reportedly kicked the suspect twice in the back and pulled him up by his hair while handcuffed. Timmons was booked at the Hilfing Liad Detention Center. Temperatures may be dropping, but one Fort Mill man is cranking up the heat in South Carolina. On October 9th, the Guinness Book of World Records publicly named Pepper X as the hottest pepper in the world. Ed Curry, the South Carolinian who grew the Carolina Reaper pepper, broke his own world record from 2013. Curry crossbred the Carolina Reaper and a pepper he received from a friend to grow what he calls Pepper X. Pepper X measures in at 2.7 million Scoville heat units. In comparison, the Carolina Reaper measures roughly 1.2 million units. Bear Spray measures in at around 2.2 million units. And according to Curry, Pepper X completes his decade-long hunt to perfect a pepper that he says provides both immediate and brutal heat. I'm not much for hot stuff. But um, me neither. I don't really do spices. It's not. Usually... So you don't see yourself trying the pepper X no. anytime soon. Do you see yourself trying? Absolutely not. No. I wouldn't even taste the Carolina Reaper pepper. When I don't first... like normal peppers. Well, actually, no. Wait, no, no. I I was I was thinking on that decision, but I mm -hmm. I stick with. I will not be trying mm -hmm. any pepper. Reaper X. True. None of them. Put it on a street taco and maybe I'll try it. Yeah. A new lawsuit against the social media company Meta was filed this past Thursday. Meta owns and operates social media platforms such as Facebook and Instagram. 42 states have sued against Meta for allegedly having the intention of harming children's mental health. The South Carolina Attorney General, Alan Wilson, is partaking in the lawsuit, claiming the company has, quote, knowingly designed and deployed harmful features that purposely addict children and teens, end quote. This lawsuit is seeking financial damages as well as a stop to the company's harmful practices, assumingly in violation of the law. According to Experian, a data analytics reporting company, 98% of college-age students are on social media. College students today, ages 18 through 22, are one of the first generations raised in a social media dominated world. As the hotter seasons wind down and that sunshine dopamine starts to fade, students may take more time now to look towards their social media platforms. The owner of a counseling service, Samantha Cooper, says, quote, social media provides kind of like that dopamine experience for children and adolescents. It gives them that quick reward, end quote. Cooper says these platforms can still provide benefits by reducing the harmful effects, such as setting limits. 
A spokesperson from Meta stated that they have already introduced over 30 tools to support teens and their families and are disappointed with the path these attorneys have chosen to take. USC continues to embody the importance of mental health through multiple events, wellness services, and more. A manhunt is ongoing for the suspect in multiple mass shootings in Maine. On Wednesday evening, a gunman opened fire in two locations, killing at least 18 people and injuring 13 others. Officials named 40-year-old Robert Card as the primary suspect. Police issued an arrest warrant on multiple murder charges, murder charges this morning. The shootings took place at a bowling alley and a bar in Lewiston, Maine. Lewiston is Maine's second largest city, about 30 miles north of Portland. After the incident, many local schools and businesses closed today as authorities urge residents to shelter in place. This is the 565th mass shooting in the United States alone this year. Wow, such heavy stuff. All of us here at SGTV are thinking of those involved. Coming up after the break, SGTV weather reporter Nicole Smith will let us know if we can expect this cool weather to stick around. Stay close. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Nicole Smith. Here's your look at tonight's forecast. You can see those temperatures are going to be hitting a low of 57 here tonight with that humidity hitting 92%, so pretty, pretty high. But hopefully you got to catch, get out, catch that sunset at 637 p.m. Now, looking at those highs for the week, we're going to have that warm front coming on in. So you can see we're going to have some higher temperatures throughout the week, but that cold front is not far behind. You can see we're going to have a significant drop between Monday and Tuesday from the high 80s to those mid 70s and it is going to keep on going down all the way to those high 50s so why you could put your jacket away for a couple on days don't put it too far away because you're gonna have to pull it right back out now taking a bigger look at what this is gonna look like for the week we're gonna have that sun coming on out so get outside have fun that sun's gonna be bright and shiny just for those weeks but here on Tuesday, it is Halloween, so if you're going out that night and doing anything, make sure you grab a jacket or anything like that. You see we're going to have temperatures as low as 46, so definitely make sure that if you don't grab a jacket, just make sure that your costume or whatever you're wearing is warm because we are going to have some colder temperatures that night. But coming up first, we're going to have that football game here Saturday. It won't be in Columbia. It's going to be in College Station, Texas. So as you can see, they're going to be in a low pressure system this week. So they're going to be having storms all throughout the week. But what we really care about is those days that we'll be traveling in the game. So we see a Friday and Sunday. We're going to have thunderstorms. So make sure you're safe, especially when you're going there and coming back. But on Saturday, we're going to have some mostly clear skies and some cooler temperatures. So perfect conditions for that game. So go support our Gamecocks over there in Texas because that game day is going to be great for us to play. And that's all I have for tonight. Coming up after the break, SGTV sports reporter Violet Raftery and Marissa Walmark will have the latest in sports. You don't want to miss it. Stay with us. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Violet Raftery. And I'm Marissa Womack, here to give you the latest in sports. It's been almost four months since the passing of Nikki McCray Penson, but her memory has not been forgotten by her former teams. USC and Rutgers honored McCray Penson at Colonial Life Arena prior to their exhibition game on Sunday. McCray Penson played college basketball at Tennessee and professionally in the WNBA before beginning her coaching career at Western Kentucky. She then joined Don Staley's staff as assistant coach at South Carolina before serving as head coach at Old Dominion and Mississippi State and later returning to an assistant coaching role at Rutgers. Staley remembers McCray Penson fondly. I want everybody to, to know what she brought to the table, what she brought to women's basketball. And it was a, a tireless work. Like it was a thankless job that she did every single day. And she wanted nothing but to make other people happy. McCray Penson passed in July after a battle with breast cancer. And Sunday's pregame ceremony encouraged those in attendance to donate to the In the Middle organization in her honor. In the Middle is a local organization that aims to help breast cancer patients and their families manage the financial burden that cancer brings. And along with honoring McCray Penson, the Gamecock fans in attendance got their first look at the new South Carolina team. All 11 players on the Gamecock roster hit the court, 
as senior Camilla Cardoso landed a team-leading 17 points. On Tuesday, Cardoso was named to the preseason All-SEC First Team by votes from SEC head coaches, and the Gamecock team was predicted to finish second in the SEC behind defending national champion LSU. This past Saturday, the Gamecocks made their way to the other Columbia to play Missouri Tigers. The Tigers offense went to work quickly against the Gamecocks defense, finishing the first half of the game 24-3. Quarterback Spencer Rattler threw 40 passes but completed only 23 of those. Mario Anderson led South Carolina in rushing Saturday with 68 yards on the ground. Tight end Trey Knox running back to carry on Joyner and Anderson caught each of their targets from Rattler. Nick Harbour had the most receiving yards, however, the highly touted freshman had just caught two of those for 50 yards. Ultimately, the Gamecocks were defeated 34 to 12. At two and five on this season, the Gamecocks now head to Texas A&M to face the Aggies at noon on Saturday. You know, I'm just hoping that they can turn it around this Saturday to head into Willie B with a win. That would be great. Yeah, because, I mean, four back-to-back -back home games, I know the Gamecock fans are hoping to see some wins in person. So turning this season around might be the move. Definitely. Now, Gamecock men's soccer came close to upsetting then-second-ranked UCF on Sunday, posing a threat late in the game. The Gamecocks ultimately fell 3-2, to two, but one South Carolina player came out of the night with something worth celebrating. Senior forward Adam Luckhurst tallied his team-leading sixth goal of the season, surpassing his own career high of five that he set last year. Luckhurst scored the first regular season of the goal for the er, regular season goal for the Gamecocks at Campbell on August 24th, and has found the back of the net against Queens University Charlotte, James Madison, Jacksonville, West Virginia, and now UCF. After the weekend, Luckhurst is tied for fifth in both goals and goals per game in the Sun Belt Conference this season. He started all 14 games for South Carolina this year, recording just shy of 1,000 minutes on the pitch. Fans have one more chance to see Luckhurst at Stone Stadium. The Gamecocks will play their last home game of the regular season tomorrow night. Luckhurst and six of his fellow teammates will be honored for senior night as South Carolina hosts Coastal Carolina at 7 p.m. Following the Gamecocks' 4-0 win against the Georgia Bulldogs, there were a few recognitions for the women's soccer team. Fifth-year defender Cameron Dixon was the first in the spotlight, with her start in Sunday's game being her 100th career game played. Goalkeeper Heather Hens, another fifth-year, followed being named the SEC's Co-Defensive Player of the Week. She is now the second Gamecock on the women's soccer team to be recognized for a week by the Southeastern Conference this season. The Gamecocks were ranked 17th going into the game Sunday and have since risen to 13th going into tonight's game, which is their final regular season game against the Florida Gators in Gainesville. But the SEC was not the only group to notice the team's performance. College Soccer News named the Gamecocks the Team of the Week. And the MLB World Series field is set. It's the Texas Rangers against the Arizona Diamondbacks. And that means former Gamecocks Jordan Montgomery and Christian Walker will take the biggest stage in baseball. Montgomery recorded two wins in three appearances on the mound for the Rangers in the American League Championship Series. And Walker was in the Diamondbacks starting lineup for all seven games of the National League Championship Series. Game one of the World Series is tomorrow in Texas at 8.03 p.m. And the current Gamecock baseball team is set to scrimmage for six innings at 3.45 p.m. tomorrow. So fans can enjoy a bit of a South Carolina baseball doubleheader with free entry at Founders Park in the MLB World Series streaming on Fox. So another early look. They've been scrimmaging a bit. If you haven't had a chance to make it out to Founders, it's really fun to see this team play each other, high energy, 
Yeah, especially after how they finished last season. I think that they have a really good look. Um, they got a fresh team right now. They, they're going to be looking good. And it's free. Now, coming up after the break, SGTV Entertainment reporters Chloe Castain and, em and Emma Connolly will lay down the talk of the town. Stay tuned. Welcome back, Carolina. I'm Emma Connolly. And I'm Chloe Castain, here to give you the latest in this week's entertainment. If you're looking to celebrate spooky season a little early, Columbia's Riverbank Zoo has you covered. Their annual Halloween event boo at the zoo is still happening and you won't want to miss it. While most animal exhibits will be closed, the event offers tons of Halloween fun. Families can trick or treat inside the zoo, watch a moonlight magic show, and they even have their own freaky deaky DJ. Tickets are available to the general public at $20 and $17 for Riverbanks members. Boo at the zoo goes until October 30th from 6 to 9, so if you want an opportunity to get dressed up and see the zoo after hours, now is your chance. Just don't forget your trick or treat bag for fun Halloween goodies. And if you're looking forward to the holidays ahead, the Columbia Fireflies just released their Holiday Lights promotional schedule. The Fireflies Holiday Lights will be held at Segra Park for the second year in a row and go from November 16th until December 30th. For each day of the week during the season, the lights will have a reoccurring theme, so you can kick off the opening of the lights with the first Thirsty Thursday, followed by a TD Bank Tuesday, Wag Wednesdays, and more. And throughout the whole thing, you'll be able to meet Santa, get fun and festive treats, and even pick out your Christmas tree with the Richardson Tree Farm. The lights will be open almost every night from 6 to 9, with tickets going on sale November 1st. You can find specific event details on the team's event calendar. Now, I'm not going to lie, I am a Christmas girl. November 1st, it is Christmas for me. Right, so this was a very heated topic. I am one to really enjoy all the seasons. I feel like Thanksgiving doesn't get its time to shine. Um, so with this debate, I'm not sure if you guys are gonna see another working relationship with oh. Emma and I. I still love to eat my turkey, but are there even any Thanksgiving songs? Right, and even though you still love to eat turkey, I, I really respect that, Emma. I do still love you, but Thanksgiving has to have its moment to shine. Uh, we can't just throw it away for nothing because then what are we going to do with the rest of November? Christmas. All right, uh, <laughs> Emma actually has more for you. So yoga is a great way to relax while also getting in a workout. Thanks to the Columbia Metropolitan Art Museum, members of the local community can participate in a fun and engaging yoga class on, at the museum on the 13th. The event at 6 p.m. is open to anyone ages 13 and up, but no unattended minors are allowed. Tickets are $15 to the general public and $12 for current members of the museum. The yoga class will be taught by local dance and yoga instructor, Panna Chauhan, and will be at a level most can enjoy. You can register for the event on the museum's website columbiamuseum.org. Singer, songwriter, and acrobatic extraordinary, Pink, has been touring for quite a while. You may have seen the clips of her swinging around arenas all while she sings, but have you seen how she trains? In a recent Tell All 60 Minutes interview, Pink discussed her past as a rowdy teen, her sellout concerts, and just how she keeps in shape. She said, I don't eat well to look good. I eat well to go far, fast, and hard. In a viral video, Pink is seen laying on the ground in the grass in a hollow hold while her trainer, former P90X star, Drea Weber, stands on her stomach. Incredibly, Pink is able to sing her hit song, Try, whilst her trainer is putting all of her weight on her abs. Pink spoke additionally in the interview about how she struggled with drugs as a teen and overdosed, which led to her quitting. This is an important message for young adults to know that they can grow from struggles and work past them, as Pink now has an incredibly highly grossing tour that she feels is a safe place for people of all backgrounds. 
And I love Pink. I've loved her music since I was a little girl. And I just think it's incredible how strong she is. Like, she's 44 and can do all of this gymnastics while singing and putting on a show. I was just about to say that the fact that she's 44, I'm 20 years old. These are supposed to be my prime years, and I can't even do half that. Um, no. So where and when I'm going to get started, I don't know. But I definitely am wanting to try out Pink's regime. I think I should try right now. Like, you can stand on me, and I'll try to sing. And, well, I would love to do that, Emma. That's all your energy entertainment news for tonight. After the break, we'll have tonight's edition of Carolina Canines. And finally, tonight's Carolina Canine features Ash. This sweet pup was submitted by our very own SGD SGTV training director, Abby Tam. Ash is a three-year-old standard poodle who loves to sleep on the couch, eat snacks, that aren't his and play with his cousin Coco. <laughs> See, I think me and Ashley get along real well. I also like to eat snacks in our mind. Yeah, I'm gonna keep my snacks away from him. I'm like really, really like, like I cannot have anyone touch them. Like you cannot have some. Mm. No, we're not sharing, it's mine. We'll keep it's them away from me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that wraps up tonight's edition of Student News at 7. Be sure to follow us on Instagram, X, and Facebook at SGTV at USC. To keep up with all of our content, be sure to also visit us online at SGTV at USC.com. For SGTV, I'm Elizabeth Martinez. And I'm Clarissa Meyer. From all of us here at SGTV, have a great night, Carolina, forever to thee.